Hello again, class. This is Dr. Trunk with the second part of a lecture on statistics that we are doing this week. You may remember that in the previous video I talked about descriptive statistics and inferential statistics, with the former being summative and the latter being causative. We looked at calculations for the most common forms of central tendency, which are the mean, the median, and the mode. And we also looked at how to interpret the standard deviation and variance, as well as the range. What we're going to do today is to look in a little bit more detail about some of the problems on the checkpoints that you're going to be asked to solve. In those problems, you're going to be given a set of data, kind of like this, which is the same data we had yesterday. And you remember we calculated the mean to be 7 and the standard deviation to be 2.31. So in your homework assignment, you're going to have to do the same thing. You'll have to get a calculator, I recommended something similar to this, the TI-30 from Walmart for about $10, and calculate the mean and the standard deviation. Uh, as well as a few other summary statistics. And then we can start to get into what we call z-scores. Now before I talk about z-scores, I need to say a couple words about this kind of distribution right here at the top. This is called the normal distribution. It's not normal because it's the, the word normal in everyday life. It's just the name of the function that generates this particular curve. Some things to notice about this is that it is a symmetric curve. So 50% of the scores are on this side of this line, which is right down the middle, and 50% of the scores are on that line. This line separates the two halves, and it is the point that we call the mean, the median, and the mode. In other words, in a normal distribution, the mean, median, and mode are all the same point. So if this distribution represented this score, as it doesn't, but pretend it did, if we knew the mean was 7, we would know that the median is also 7 and the mode is also 7. What we're going to do with z-scores is to find the relative location of one of these scores on this uh, figure. We'll see how that works in just a moment. This is an example of a skewed distribution. Notice it's not symmetric like this one here. Most of the scores are on the low side and fewer and fewer as the scores get higher are showing up. In this picture, the tail of the distribution is pointed in the positive direction, so we call that a positively skewed distribution. If I had flipped it around and the tail was pointing in this direction, it would be a negatively skewed distribution. I've written the formulas for the z-score, the t-score, and the iq-score. Uh, for the stainine score, there is a table that allows you to convert z-scores to uh, stainine scores. So we're not really going to talk about stainine scores anymore in this uh, video. However, the most important is the z-score. And if you look at the formula, this little x just stands for one of these values. So you take a value, you subtract the mean, and you divide by the standard deviation, and then you get a z-score. Now, one of the scores here, we could get a z-score for any one of these that we wanted to, but we can also get z-scores for something that doesn't appear on the set of scores. Say we wanted to know the z-score for 5. Well, that's no problem. We would take 5, subtract 7 and divide by 2.31 and you will get a z-score. A z of 0 means that the score is right on the mean and we can see that because this score is 7 and the mean is 7 and 7 minus 7 is 0 and anything with 0 in the numerator is 0. So 7 is going to be right here. Notice that 8, 9, and 10 are positive so the z-score will be positive and these other numbers, like 3 and 6, are less than the mean, so the z-score will have a negative sign associated with it. In other words, scores higher than the mean will be positive, and scores lower than the mean will be negative. But what does it actually mean? A z-score tells you how many standard deviations above or below the mean a raw score is. So if someone had a z-score of 1, 
they are one standard deviation above the mean. For example, if we take the mean of 7 and go up one standard deviation, we're at 9.31. We just add these two. So anyone who has a score of 9.31 would have a z-score of 1 because they are exactly one standard deviation above the mean. The t-score is a converted z-score. And you can see that to calculate a t-score, you first find the z-score, multiply that by 10, and add 50. Okay, So let's say again that the, um, the score we're using, for example, is 7. 10 times the z-score of 7, you may remember, is 0, because 7 is equal to the mean, and 7 minus 7 is 0. 10 times 7, I'm sorry, 10 times 0 is 0, plus 50 is 50. The t-score has a mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 10. The z-score has a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. To convert to IQ scores, as you're being asked in your homework, your checkpoints, just again, take the z-score, multiply by 15, and add 100. Okay. So, here are a couple of examples that I've worked out for you. What is the z-score for a score of 8? Well, what we would do is we would take the score, the raw score, x, subtract the mean, which is 7, and divide by the standard deviation, which is 2.31, and we get 0.43. Now, what does that 0.43 mean? It means that this person, first of all, we notice it's positive because 8 is bigger than 7, and 7 is the mean. That's why the z is positive. This person is 0.43 standard deviations above the mean. In other words, if you took 0.43 times the standard deviations and added it to 7, you would get 8. They are 0.43, almost a half a standard deviation bigger than the mean. What is a z-score of 5? OK, it doesn't matter that 5 isn't in there. Uh, we can still find the z-score, and it doesn't matter that it could be 5.5 or 8.1. There's nothing special about decimals. We take our formula, which is a 5 minus 7, the score minus the mean, and divide by 2.31. Now we get negative because 5 is less than the mean of 7. So this person is negative 0.87 standard deviations. Not quite a whole standard deviation lower than the mean. To convert to t-scores, we simply use our formula, 10 times z. So for the score of 8, z was 0.43. We add 50, and we get 54.3. These two things are identical to one another. If this person was 0.43 standard deviations above the mean for z, they're going to be 0.43 standard deviations above the mean for the t-score. And the same thing, the, the z-score for 5 was negative 0.87. So we multiply that by 10, we add 50, and now we get 41.3. Remember the mean of the t-score is 50. This person was below the mean for z, so they're going to be below the mean for t as well. And finally, for IQ scores, we just do the same thing. We just plug our z-score in here, and you can do the math yourself. You can see that the mean is 100, and this person is above the mean. How far above the mean? 0.43 standard deviations, where standard deviation is 15. And for the same thing here, notice that this is below 100 because this z-score is below 100. If you have any questions on that as you're doing the problems or after you've done the checkpoint, just give me a call or write me an email, and we can go over it together. The last thing I want to quickly tell you about are these statistics here, uh, actually statistical tests. We are not going to actually be running these statistical tests. That would be for people going on to write a master's thesis or a doctoral dissertation or publish a research paper. But basically, if we read a journal article and they mention ANOVA, what does it mean? You know, what did they do? So it's kind of like right now, uh, I don't understand how my car engine works, but I understand how to work my car, right? We don't need to know the, the mathematics or the details of how to do this test, just like I don't need to understand 
how my engine works in order to drive my car. I just need to know how to drive my car. We just need to know basically what these do. So what do they do? The t-test looks at significant differences between two groups. So let's say that we had scores for women on a quiz and we had scores for men on a quiz. The women would have an average. We would just add up the women's scores and divide by how many women took the quiz. And the men's scores would have an average. We would just add up the men's scores and divide by how many scores the men did. Well, those two numbers will be different, but are they significantly different? By significantly different, I mean probably enough to make a difference, probably not by chance. If I've got $5 in my pocket and you've got $5.01, it's true you have more money, but do you have significantly more money? What if I have $5 and you have $6, or I have $5 and you have $7, $5 you have $8? At what point does it become so different that it's unlikely that they really are just varying due to chance? You can remember the T, and notice it's a lowercase t. This uppercase T is a T-score. This lowercase t is a t-test, and it's easy to get them confused. The t-test looks at two groups. Oh, I have a visitor. You guys, this is Melina. I don't know if you can see her or not, but she just kind of jumped jumped up here. I'll let her say hi to you guys. She's really into statistics, as you can see. So this is Melina, and you might be interested to know that the word Melina means raspberry in Russian. Yay! Okay, go away. I mean, that was Melina. So, back to the important things. We have, by the way, five cats, which is statistically significant. ANOVA stands for ANOVA. ANOVA stands for Analysis of Variance. Analysis of Variance. It's always in capital letters. <laughs> the Analysis of Variance is like the t-test it's like the t-test but involves more than two groups <laughs> sorry my wife is filming this and she's laughing because i said significantly d with cats so a little humor that happens when we're live can't help it so analysis of variance will look at maybe three groups or four groups or five groups <laughs> is going away to hysterically laugh. Sorry about that, you guys. But this is a real household and things happen. So the analysis of variance might look at freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors. That's four groups. Notice it's still one variable, but it is four groups. So if we looked at the grade point averages for the freshman class, the sophomore class, the junior class, and the senior class, do those four GPAs significantly differ from one another? We can't do the t-test because t only looks at two groups. Since this one has four groups, we would do an analysis of variance. Correlation looks at a linear relationship between variables. Correlation, as you will be reading and maybe even know, doesn't mean that something causes something else. It just means they go together. Correlations can range between negative one and positive one, and as the correlation moves away from zero, the stronger it is. Regression is related to correlation in that regression makes a prediction. For instance, if we had a list of people's grade point averages in high school, could we predict from that their grade point average in college? College grade point average is correlated with high school grade point average. So if there is a significant correlation, we could probably make reasonable predictions about their high school or, or from their high school GPA to their college GPA. Um, these top four are called parametric statistics or parametric statistical tests and the reason is that they involve real numbers like GPA, gas mileage, income. This last one that I've written down here is called chi-square and chi-square is a non-parametric test. What I mean by that is that chi-square looks at frequencies. For example, here at Bellevue, taking my class, we have men and women, 
and let's just say that we have Republicans and Democrats. Is there a relationship between gender, which is a nominal variable, and political party, which is a nominal variable? Since we have two nominal variables, where we're just labeling them the one and two, but the one and two don't really mean anything, we could label them at negative 665. Any two numbers that are different would work. Is there a relationship between the gender you are and the political affiliation you have? That's the kind of question that Chi-Square would ask. So thank you for listening to this video. Uh, again, I hope that the cats weren't too distracting for you. So I'm going to uh, wish you well, say goodbye for now. And again, if you have any questions, just please let me know. Thank you.